Hello everyone. Hi, I'm Tanvi Bhatt, your host for the Personal Branding Festival. And we are now going to be speaking to one of the thought leaders on the topic of personal branding, who's been a true inspiration for me at least. He is none other than Ron Malhotra. Ron, welcome to the Personal Branding Festival. Thank you so much for having me on, Tanvi. I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's been a while since somebody invited me to speak about this particular topic. So uh, very excited indeed. Brilliant. So for the few of you all who don't know Ron as yet, you know, he's not just an expert on personal branding, but in my view, he is the master of the masters and a true falling good with inimitable knowledge around the topics of thought leadership, personal branding, spiritual intelligence, wealth building, and my absolute favorite public speaking. He has been a thought leader that you literally must follow, as in follow every advice that he has to give you in our conversation today. So, Ron, without much ado, are we set? Can we begin the interview? Yes, of course. And what a wonderful endorsement you just gave me. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I meant every word of it. So, Ron, what a little I know of your story, right? You've had anything but an ordinary career graph. The last few years naturally have been extraordinary, but you didn't have very thriving beginnings. So can you help us understand, you know, your career trajectory and graph and how the transcendence happened into what you're doing today? And what are the three key things it taught you about the business of being in business? And more importantly, what you do so extraordinarily well, being an amazing thought leader and helping people transcend their own limits and be the best version of themselves. Well, well there's, a, there's a few questions in that question. So just to give you some background, um, Tanvi, I, um, I was born in India to um, an average middle class family. Right. Uh, both my parents are educated, but uh, both of them did not have thriving careers uh, and did not, um, they struggled financially. Sure. And uh, when I was very young, I started to understand that most people around me were educated, but majority of people that I knew, despite their professional and skills education, were not really living a life and lifestyle that I wanted for myself anyway. So subconsciously, I started to understand that just going to school and going to university and getting a job is not the entire answer. Right. Uh, but I had no idea what the answer was because I didn't come from a business background. So entrepreneurship was not something that I had ever considered for myself. Mm -hmm. So naturally, I followed the same path. You know, I got educated and then I got a job and things like that. And uh, because I had a real drive to be successful financially, I ended up doing very well financially. But what I realized was I wasn't really making any impact. And there was some meaning missing in the work that I was doing. So uh, I realized then, you know, and somebody, uh, there was a quote that I came across many years ago that success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And so I kind of realized that uh, although I had commercial and financial success, it wasn't fulfilling me because beyond that, I always had a desire to make a difference and make an impact. Mm -hmm. And my career was all focused on me and it wasn't really focused on me being able to make an impact. Right. So, um, so yeah, so that's basically how my journey, you know, by the, up until the age of 31, you know, I would have been considered successful in other people's standards, but in my own opinion, I wasn't successful. And so my real education really started at the age of 31. And that's when I kind of realized that there are five levels within every industry and marketplace. Mm -hmm. The only level that I knew of was that either you're a non-professional or you're a professional. And so I always assumed that becoming a professional was the epitome of career success. It was only later on that I realized that there was other levels as well. There are people who are called experts. There are people who are called authorities. And then there are people who are called celebrity authorities mm -hmm. in every industry and marketplace. And it wasn't so much about the tag of celebrity authority or the tag of authority. It was more the fact that I had observed that the people at that level were the ones that had the depth and width of impact, whereas the people at the bottom levels were not only struggling financially in most cases, but even their sphere of influence and the impact was very limited. Mm -hmm. So... Um, 
So once I discovered and understood that, then I started to make quite different career decisions for myself. I didn't just, instead of acquiring more technical education or acquiring more experience, which is typically what most professionals do, I started to think broadly about who I was, what type of footprint I wanted to leave on the planet, what kind of legacy I wanted to leave, what kind of work do I want to be known for, and what type of impact I wanted to have in the world and could I potentially align my career decisions to be able to do all of that? Mm -hmm. So that's when everything changed. And, you know, I've been on that journey for quite some time and probably one of the reasons I'm here or you even know of me is because I have been able to do those things and quite successfully probably over the last three years um, and kind of realized that this is a wonderful opportunity that everybody has access to, but unfortunately most people aren't aware And they're still following the old paradigm of career progression by simply acquiring more technical skills and education or acquiring more degrees, rather than understanding that the number one contributor of your career success is your ability to connect, lead and negotiate. And also the the number of people that know you, trust you and respect you. So that kind of changed everything for me. And, uh, you know, here we are having this conversation, which is uh, oh. it's a fascinating topic. And so I'm very happy to be contributing to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us a little more insight on what right mindset shifts you had to um, ensure that you adopt at the right times in your career. Because I, I totally agree. Not a lot of people are either, let me put it this way, aware of a better way of leading the world. Because... The way I classify it is one in our leadership and thought leadership, right? So a lot of people are still stuck in the zone of one leadership. They have not transcended to thinking like a thought leader. What was your introduction to the philosophy of thought leadership? And did you see any thought leaders around you that inspired you to think differently? And who were those early inspirations in your life? Well, this was the thing. It's uh, when I went through a process of self-discovery, I realized that I was never inspired by actors or athletes like a lot of young men. Correct. I was always inspired by people who had made a substantial difference in the world. So if you see right behind me, behind my head, you will see a picture of Gandhi. Yeah. And on one of the, on, on the, on the right side of me, you will see a picture of Martin Luther King. Right. And then over there, I've got a picture of uh, uh, Malcolm X. Mm-hmm. So, it was very unconscious to me, but when I started to actually reflect back as a child, the people who really got gave me goosebumps were not actors, were sure. not rock stars, uh, they were not athletes. They were people who had started significant movements in the world. Correct. And through those movements, they had been able to shift uh, local or national or international paradigms. Uh, but also left a very strong legacy. Now, I wasn't, I didn't know why I was inspired by these people. So I started to study about them and started to read about their backgrounds. And in every single case, these people had taken unconventional thinking. And through a set of behaviors, actions, they had taken that unconventional thinking, Mm -hmm. and they had made that thinking mainstream, and influenced millions of people along the way. This was fascinating to me because majority of people, if you, even if you look around today, here we are in 2020. Right. Majority of people make the decisions based on what's happening around them. Now, now all these individuals that I studied and I, and I examined, none of their circumstances were conducive to their success. But what was interesting and fascinating to me was that regardless of what was happening around them, these people, through their ability to think and influence, were able to make massive changes in the world, even though the odds were against them. Mm -hmm. So that became a very, um, you know, I wanted to delve deep into this science. What is it about these so, you know, ordinary individuals that have achieved this type of greatness? And was it personality attributes? Was it psychology? Or was it something greater that the world doesn't understand that these people did to make the impact that they did? Once I started to understand that, I reflected on the fact that, look, in the modern day world, 
to have an impact, you've also got to be able to brand yourself and package yourself. And I felt very fortunate about the fact that we have this thing called social media, which none of these people had. Absolutely. So I felt that we are very privileged in the, in, in, in the way of, if we have a good message that has the ability to transform lives, we can now magnify that message a lot faster than some of these people did. Uh, and so I came to the conclusion that really thought leaders are people who are known for what they know because what they know makes a difference. True. And I wanted to make a difference, but I wasn't clear on what kind of difference I wanted to make. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like an instant, quickly, quick thing where I've gone, oh, you know what? I just want to make a difference. It was like, even if I decide to make a difference, what kind of difference am I going to make? What have I done that's so extraordinary that people are going to want to hear about? Right. So all of these questions were part of my thought process and were part of my developmental journey. And then, of course, over a period of time, I became very clear on who I was, why I wanted to make a difference, what kind of difference did I want to make, which kind of people I wanted to impact, and also knowing how to impact them. I started to gradually become clear on those things. And ever since, I've been very convicted on this path and very consistent on this path in regards to doing what I very strongly believe in. Okay. So I personally believe, right, like you said, it's, it's a law of soul searching and introspection and spiritual awareness that helps us lead to the clarity on what we want to do in our life, what kind of leaders or thought leaders we want to evolve into. And thought leadership, in my humble opinion, plays an integral part in building your personal brand. Do you think you would second that or you think you've seen people build strong personal brands without having a unique perspective to offer? No, I think you're right. I mean, the personal brand is integral. So I would say that the personal brand supports thought leadership. Um, Because the first challenge that you have as a thought leader, regardless of how amazing or transformational your message is, Mm -hmm. the first challenge that you have is attention. Right. If you don't get attention, you don't get the opportunity to transform policy. You don't get the, the opportunity to transform lives. You don't get the opportunity to transform minds. True. Because the first challenge that you have is, are people even going to take notice that you exist? Correct. So from that perspective, I find that personal branding is very important because personal branding, what it does is it allows you to understand what is different about you compared to other people. And every individual is unique in terms of the fact that every purpose, every person has a unique combination of purpose, passion, values, strengths, mission, goals, and zone of genius. True. But most people don't know what that is. So once you know what makes you different, you can then strategically package that And that's what personal branding is to me. Because once you become deliberate around who you are and you want to consistently portray that image of you and you want people to know who you are beyond your name, beyond the facade, Mm -hmm. then you can control that message a lot better. And it's not, you know, when I talk about control, some people say, well, it's, is it being fake? I go, no, not at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Exactly. In fact, I would say that majority of people who don't know who they are, they're being fake because, you know, like, one of the pieces of advice I'm sure you would have heard, heard is people say, be yourself. How can you be yourself if you don't know who you are? Right? Totally. So personal branding to me is an amazing concept because personal branding allows you to be all of who you are. Rather than being partly who you are, it allows mm-hmm. you to be all of who you are because you yeah. are so clear on who you are. And once you know that, the personal brand, there are some strategic elements of a personal brand that allow you to capture that and make the intangible tangible so people can comprehend what you're about. And so a personal brand then combined with your message and your philosophy becomes a really powerful combination through which you can carry out your work and people remember you because that's the, you know, attention leads to memorability. If people can't, if people don't, you know, if people don't give you their attention and you can't command their attention even for a short period of time, you don't get the opportunity to communicate your message. True. So that's why I find that personal branding is very powerful. I'm very deliberate about my personal brand. Mm-hmm. I know who I am. I know the strategic elements in my personality that make me different from other people. And I use them to convey and communicate who I am and who I'm not. Right? So people right. can make a very easy and informed decision of whether they like me or not. 
-hmm. or whether they want to be close to me or not, or whether they want to be a part of my movement or not. Because I'm not trying to appeal to everybody. As nice as, as it would be to attract everybody, I know I'm not going to. No, but, you know, I'm not everyone's cup of tea, and nobody is. But when you know your personal brand, you're actually okay with that. You actually understand that, look, if somebody doesn't like me or they don't like something about me or they don't agree with my message, it's not personal. That person is completely entitled to make that choice. It is 100% their right to be able to make a decision and go, Ron is not my kind of person. No problem. But you know what? Every person has a message and a personality that will appeal to a particular demographic. Mm. Right? And so that's the important thing. Rather than being universally appealing, you try and be appealing to the people who you can serve the best. And that's where it becomes really powerful. Fantastic. Tell me if there was one mindset you had to pick and choose that would help a leader immediately elevate or up his game from just thinking like a leader to thinking like a thought leader, what would that be? I would say there are a few C's. Number one, courage. Okay. I mean, you can have all the talents and skills in the world. If you take two individuals, they have the same talent, the same skills and the same experience. Mm -hmm. The one that's going to do better in life and have a bigger impact and have a more intense and diverse life is the person who's got more courage. Simple as mm -hmm. that. Second is clarity. Clarity about who you are, where are you going, what kind of difference do you want to make and why you want to make that difference? Hmm. Third is character. Is there alignment between who you say you are and who you actually are? Because a lot of people these days are very good at lip service. They're very good at pretending. There's a lot of people who are fake. So the fact is, are you actually authentic? Are you sincere? Are you, is there alignment between what you say and what you do? Because ultimately, people only see the facade so true. They, get, they see the reputation, but they don't see the character up until a while. And so the character eventually reveals itself. Yeah. And, if you, and most people, because they haven't done any work on their character, what happens is they end up exposing the, um, the contradictions within their personality and between what they believe. So you need character. And I think the fourth thing that you need is competence. You've got to be good at what you do. There's no substitute for that. You can't just say, I want to be an influence. I want to be a thought leader. Hmm. Based on what exactly? What problem are you solving? Right? So you've got to have competence as well. It's not just about superficially standing out and building a personal brand. Right. It's about building a personal brand so you can serve more people. But to serve them well, you need to have a high level of competency in whatever you choose to have competency in. True. Right? So courage, clarity, character, and competency. Wow, I love your four C's. Tell me, we know there is absolutely no dearth of competence when it comes to senior executives or chief executives in the corporate world. But what is it that is holding them back from manifesting more thought leadership and building stronger personal brand as CXOs, chief executive officers, chief HR officers, whatever function they hail from? And being hailed as thought leaders in their organizations, industries, geographies, et cetera. Because we've all seen more thought leaders emerging from the hallways of entrepreneurship vis-a-vis -vis the corporate horizon. Why do you think that is? And what is it that they can do or change, the chief executives I'm talking about, to grow as a thought leader and literally make a deeper, more amplified impact as well as a thought leader in the corporate world? Well, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here. So when you, when you said, um, you know, that there is no shortage or dearth of competency in the corporate world, I don't necessarily agree with that. Okay. You have what we call technical competency in the corporate world. True. Uh, and technical competency, meaning that you know how to do your job well, you have technical expertise, maybe you have management expertise. But is that the skill set that solves the real world problem in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. That's the question. So we have to be, I'm not saying they're not skilled. They are skilled, but there is a difference in a skill set that serves the needs of a team, a department or an organization versus a skill set that is solving the problem at a broader level. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that every executive, every CEO, uh, has only a te technical skill set. I know for a fact that some of them are brilliant mm. at their ability to lead, connect and negotiate. And they have 
the type of genuine charisma that pulls people and they can make things happen. Some of them are very good at execution and decision making. So, but even despite that, you're right. A lot of them don't actually become thought leaders. There's a number of reasons for that. First, it doesn't even cross their mind that this is a possibility. Sure. Okay. So just the conceptual awareness of this concept, it never hits them that, hey, I could be more than what I'm being right now. Mm -hmm. And if I'm more than that person, my ability to impact is widened and deepened. So the first is they just don't have the awareness. Second, I think it's a misguided view that thought leadership is about showing off or it's about this superficially mm -hmm. standing out. And I think that the reason why some people may have negative connotations with the word thought leader, and I've actually seen it on LinkedIn, mm. is because a lot of people see bad examples of thought leadership. And rather than just objectively looking at the bad examples for being bad examples, what they end up doing is in their mind, they end up saying, well, this is what all thought leaders do. Right. So they don't apply any objective analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they end up, tainting everybody who calls themselves a thought leader. So, if, for example, the word influencers become a dirty word these days. Why? Because mm -hmm. a lot of self-proclaimed influencers are effectively just glorified marketers uh, who are de deceiving people and selling yeah. products and services. And they're very good at getting attention, but they're not very good at adding value. True. And so the average person doesn't really apply critical thinking and makes, you know, snap level judgments and goes, well, influencer, influencers are all fake thought leaders is basically a people who just put all this value on themselves, but they don't really add value. Well, the fact is there's some tremendous thought leaders. Now, majority of thought leaders didn't actually choose to be a thought leader. They became thought leader by virtue of their character and competence, which was eventually recognized. Sure. But these days there is a case for being deliberate about building a thought leadership. If you have good, positive and genuine intent and you want to add value and you have the capability to add value, there is nothing wrong in strategically positioning yourself and marketing yourself to be able to add that value. Rather than wait to be recognized, there are things that you can proactively do to be recognized. So the second reason why a lot of executives and CEOs don't stand out is because, as I said, they have a negative connotation to the word uh, thought leader, maybe. The third might be that they may feel like visibility uh, they don't want the visibility because, number one, they may have some concerns that their organization may not support that visibility. Mm -hmm. They may be, Their organization or team may be threatened by that visibility. They may assume that the individual in question is building their visibility because they're probably looking to attract other job prospects. Right. It's also something that, that, uh, that prevents them. And the fourth is they're not really clear on articulating their message. So... They may be very good at doing things, but they haven't really stopped to think about what they're doing. So everything that they're doing, all of their competence is largely an unconscious process to them. They've never made it conscious because mm -hmm. the moment you're a thought leader, it's not just about doing, it's also about being able to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. So a lot of them have not gone through that process of unpacking and dissecting their skill set and going, look, this is what I've done. This is why, what we've done really well. This is how it's unique. And we have the potential to package this and do something with it. Then I think the fifth reason is that a lot of people don't actually know how to package their intellectual property. And especially nowadays, there's a lot of superficial advice. Oh, why don't you just write a book? Or why don't you just go and speak on stage? And that will make you a thought leader. Well, no, it doesn't. Because effectively, you've still got to have some substance that you can deliver. And just by merely writing a book or by being on stage, it doesn't make you a thought leader. Yes, every thought leader should speak on stage and every thought leader should write a book and be published because if you have something valuable to say, you want to package it. But there's a difference in saying that, you know, uh, it's a bit like saying all apple is fruit and all fruit is apple. No, it's not. All right. apple is fruit, but not all fruit is apple. In a very similar way, um, every thought leader should write and speak, but not every speaker and writer is a thought leader. I right? couldn't agree more, absolutely. So, uh, so I think it's just an understanding of this concept. And, um, and so I think these are the contributing factors. And I think, and then of course, as I said, courage is another one of them. I think a lot of people, I mean, we have to look at the, one of the most primitive fears that human beings have is the fear of judgment, the fear of rejection and the fear of embarrassment. True. So even though sometimes they'll have a great message uh, and they're doing some great work within their organization as a potentially entrepreneur, or they're doing work within the industry that's really valuable and they're impacting lives, 
they don't have the courage to take it out there in the in the broader marketplace True. because of the fear of judgment or the fear of embarrassment or the fear of rejection so that also i think holds them back wow i think you beautifully captured this essence of it that most of potential thought leaders have not really taken the plunge because of the critical fear of judgment rejection and embarrassment that is of course even to have we all are going to have those inhibitions of expressing ourselves uh, showing off a vulnerability showing across the ups and downs of journey that we've had but that is where you're actually going to be establishing that human to human connection that everyone is seeking because everyone knows that if your story is all rosy it's possibly not true right because there's no human on this earth who's had it an absolute you know singular trajectory of career progression or growth all of us go through ups and downs right mm-hmm. and i've seen in fact more and more often people who've gone through the worst phases of their lives have really evolved out of the hallmarks of vanilla leadership and been able to express their unique idea perspective and help others not make the same mistakes or go through the same struggles they've gone through so tell me how deeply is there a connection according to you between a person's ability to evolve as a thought leader to his innate spiritual awareness uh, this is one of the best questions i've actually ever been asked what a wonderful question thank you and as you were talking about it i'm going this is so true i think there is something something has to be said about people who have gone through adversity and pain correct because one of the things about one of the gifts of adversity and one of the gifts of pain that you've gone through is that it takes the focus off you when you've kind of encountered when you've hit the rock bottom and survived it mm uh you're not afraid of too many things like for example you know uh, you know i i enjoy being liked by people but if people don't like me it doesn't seem to affect me as much as it affects a lot of other people Right. And that's because I've gone through far greater challenges in life in terms of being ostracized, rejected, so on and so forth in my past. That somebody not liking me, somebody disagreeing with me, somebody abusing me, somebody attacking me doesn't really make much of a difference to me because in the scheme of things I still consider myself to be extremely blessed for the fact that I hit the rock bottom and I didn't stay there. Right. So I think and I think that's might be one of the reasons why so many uh, people who become speakers and authors are people who've actually gone through a significant event in their life. So I think there's definitely a connection somewhere because uh, when you've gone through extreme pain, I think it also gets you out of your head. Yeah. And if you survive it, it gets you into you you become familiar with a part of you that you weren't familiar with. For example, a lot of human beings live in their body and their mind. but once you've gone through a very extreme event in life you start to see you start to see yourself as more than just a body and mind true and we talk about spiritual awareness that's really what spiritual awareness is to me spiritual awareness is an understanding of the human nature that goes beyond the sensory factors beyond what we can see second part of spiritual awareness to me is an understanding of our connection with the world and others mm-hmm. are we just here to pay bills drive a nice car have a nice house have a retirement fund and then die or is there a greater purpose to our life you right. start asking those types of questions especially when you hit adversity and the third part is understanding you know the nature of energy frequency and vibration mm. uh, as an example much of my accomplishments are do not attribute to my own intellect right now that might sound very esoteric to some people and they may say well, what do you mean by that mm-hmm. well I remember the days when I used to be in my head and I remember the days when I was like I'm going to solve this problem I can do this I can do this I never succeeded I was struggling when I let go a little bit I became and when I say let go I never stopped working towards it by the way let go doesn't mean being lazy mm-hmm. let go means you know what you want but you're not concerned with how and when it's going to take place right okay I always wanted more. I've always had an intense desire for being successful and for making it making a difference, but I stopped controlling how and when it was going to take place. Wow. Okay. And that requires a little bit of faith in something greater than you. True. Some people may call that nature, some people may call that the universe, some people may call that God. You know, I know that for me personally, my spiritual awareness is an acknowledgement of the fact that I'm not it. 
that it's not all coming from here, mm. that as long as I do some right things and my intent is good and I have the courage that I will be given the resources and the ideas that I need at the right time to be able to do what I need to do. As an example, you and I, you know, you said to me before this meeting, you said, Ron, do you want to know what questions I'm going to ask? Right. And I said, no, I don't need to know. And not because I trust my capabilities. It's because I have faith in, in a bigger intelligence than me. And I allow that intelligence to work through me at the right times. But for me, and I, I have noticed this time and time again, when I go back into my instinct, when I'm only concerned about myself, I don't get this power. Hmm. It's only revealed to me, you know, um, when I think of genuinely serving a big greater purpose than me and I'm not just thinking about my own needs and I'm not in fear and I'm, I'm really thinking about the vision and that's when it reveals itself and I can see it because there's been so many times I've spoken on stage and I've come back from the stage mm -hmm. and people have gone that was brilliant you spoke for eight hours without looking at a slide wow and and then they say to me do you remember what and next day they said do you remember what you said and I said I don't you know, and it's not something you can explain to people who have not experienced it. But if people have experienced it, hopefully some of the people who are listening to this would have experienced it. And hopefully they're agreeing with me and emphatically nodding because they've, at some point in their life, they've experienced it themselves. So, mm -hmm. so to me, that, what, that's what it means to be spiritual. And I think uh, the question is, if I had a comfortable, consistent and stable life, would I have been this person? I don't believe so. True. Right? So those challenging experiences have pro probably been the greatest blessings and assets in my life to give me the courage and the confidence to go after the, the bigger vision. Wow. I, I totally agree. I think um, as a race, we all have the potential. Some of us recognize it, some of us are absolutely oblivious of it to tap into the collective consciousness and draw whatever we need at that point of time and serve the higher purpose because after every birth that we keep on taking and coming back again and again and again different avatars we're just trying to enrich the collective consciousness with every unique perspective of growth that we've had as consciousness in a human form to do something better to rediscover ourselves and um transcend the all of humanity uh, I, we could talk at this all day long but before we go off track let me come back to thought leadership tell me you spoke about five tiers right about transcendence what are those levels or tiers that a person needs to go to grow from being just a professional to probably an empire builder like you put it well so if you actually look at the as i was saying i mean if you look at the the world workforce mm -hmm. we would probably say the majority of people across the entire global workforce will either be in the category of non-professionals, right. meaning that they haven't done too much a specialized education or specialized work in their area, um, their chosen occupation, or professionals where they have done specialized work and they have acquired specialized skills in their chosen profession. Correct. I would say the majority of the, the workforce is made up of those two groups. Mm -hmm. There is, but here's the difference. When you're a non-professional, you're somebody who is probably at the greatest risk of job loss, the greatest risk of being overlooked, and the greatest risk of being underpaid. Especially now that we are starting to see global trends of automation, outsourcing, and artificial intelligence increase. Correct. The people who are going to be at the greatest risk are the people who are non-professionals. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, we thought that we were secure if we became professionals, that our future was secure. But that was more in the information age or the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the industrial revolution. Now that we are no longer in the information age, mm -hmm. there is not much value placed on information in the world because information is easily accessible and available to everybody through Google and through the internet. Professionals are also at increased risk. Um, especially through artificial intelligence trends. Some, you know, I think it was Jack Ma that said 800 million jobs will be lost in the next 10 years. And 
according to some reports, there is a $7 trillion disruption expected in the job market, which is predominantly going to hit the white collar work workers. Correct. So both these groups are at massive risk. And why? Because both these groups, um, I believe, are looking in the rearview mirror to make their career decisions. Mm. And they didn't do, they didn't really proactively manage their careers and didn't look forward and say, hey, the world is changing, right? Um, and, and, and I need to adapt. Uh, even today, we see a, a, a significant number of people globally who are spending a tremendous amount of money on acquiring academic skills or professional skills, but spending practically no time on developing themselves True. personally, not developing their leadership capabilities, not developing their entrepreneurial capabilities, not developing their ability to um, emotionally connect with people. Uh, not developing their ability to market and sell or persuade or negotiate and relying on the assumption that by having a good technical skill set that they're going to be okay for the next 30 or 40 years. Well, artificial intelligence trends uh, basically can do a lot of the work that human beings do, uh, which especially the work that relies predominantly on the intellect, mm. but it cannot replace skills which rely on imagination and intuitive faculties. True. And most people have in the corporate world, as well as the academic people who have come through the academic world have highly developed intellects, but poorly developed imagination and poorly developed intuitive faculties. Sure. And because of that, they are not flexible. They are unable to come up with initiatives. They're unable to disrupt. They're unable to invent. They're unable to innovate. They're unable to... Right. Um, you know, come up with new ideas. They, they don't come up with original thoughts. They typically make good followers, but not good leaders. Hmm. So for that reason, you know, and, the, and we have so many problems in the world today, we still have problems with food, sustainable food. We have problems with social justice. We have problems with organizational change. We have problems with inspiration and joy. We have problems with productivity and performance. Who's going to solve these problems? The academic world has already demonstrated it cannot Corporations have already demonstrated their inability to be able to solve these social problems and even organizational problems. So who's going to solve these problems? Well, thought leaders and entrepreneurs are going to solve these problems. Governments are not solving these problems either, right? But the thing is, when you have, and here's the problem, and when I say this, people say, you know, but you sound so anti-employee. I go, no, I'm not. Employees are needed. I'm not anti-employee. I'm yeah. anti-employee mindset. Right. The mindset is the issue. But when you think like an employee, you don't think about solving a problem. You think about what degree can I get that will make me look good, that will get me the salary, that will get me the work experience so I can buy my house and my car and I can spend time with my family. Think about it, right? Yeah. There is nothing in that consciousness to say, hey, there is a problem out there in the world that's frustrating me and a lot of people and I'm going to take the risk and I'm going to come up with the ideas to solve that problem. That ex doesn't exist in the consciousness of the employee. And I'm not being insulting to the employee. My actual dispute or my conflict is more with the system that produces this mindset. True. So that's where thought leaders and entrepreneurs are now coming up with disruptive ideas mm. and disruptive solutions because there is a massive overall required of this situation. The, the, you know, I remember I was at one seminar and the person who was speaking, he said, did you know that 5% of the human population is responsible for all of human progress? Wow. So the question then becomes, if 5% of the human population is responsible for all of human progress, what are the other 95% is doing? Now, you might say, well, some people will say, but no, not everybody wants to make a difference. Not Okay, no, it's not about want. It's about, do you have an obligation to, when we still live in a world where there's poverty, we still live in a world where there's crime, we still live in a world where there's sex trafficking, human trafficking, we are still living in a world where there's so many environmental problems, there's problem with animal rights, minority rights, and you're sitting here going, not everybody wants to do it. So what do you want to do? You want to take care of your family? Fine, well, guess what? you're not even going to be able to do that because that consciousness and mindset has resulted in resistance to change. And now that the change has come, 
you're finding yourself completely unprepared. You yeah. see? So the joke's on who now, right? And I don't say this with any malice. I say it because it's about awakening people. I mean, the, I'm sure that the reason, one of the reasons you decided to step into thought leadership is because at some point you've gone, oh my God, why don't people get this? Whatever your this is. Yeah. And then you've got, I need to wake people up in the area that I, I, I'm passionate about. And that's why we become thought leaders because we see something that others are not seeing. We're seeing it before they're seeing it. And we're seeing further than they're seeing it. And we go, we need to let, the, let everybody else see it as well. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, the, this is the whole part of the journey is to, you know, um, helping people understand that, look, if you, if you remain at the non-professional professional level, you're at risk. So you better do something to either make yourself an expert. You can be an entrepreneur. You can be an expert employee. You can be an expert entrepreneur. You can be an expert thought leader. It doesn't really matter. Right. But the expertise is not just around technical skills. It's actually around solving a particular problem. Hmm. And when you're an authority, you have basically demonstrated that you have enough credibility and notability because of the work that you've already done. And naturally, people like that attract more attention. And they're given more opportunities. So if you want to have more opportunities, well, this is the gateway to having more opportunities. And of course, having more money as well. And then, of course, once you become or what you want to recognize as a celebrity, then your impact is widened because, you know what, everybody who gets all the publicity, the celebrities, right? So in the past, what used to happen was the people who became the mainstream celebrities in the world always came from the world of music, entertainment or sports, which I've never understood. Like, why the hell do we make heroes out of people who get, get, get paid millions of bucks for kicking a ball? and not really directly making a difference to the world. And the people who actually make a difference to the world, you know, some of our teachers, for example, are so underpaid. Correct. But anyway, this, is, this reflects the mass consciousness of the public that make heroes out of people who play music or run after a ball. But when it comes to, or for example, and, and people might laugh at this and go run, but that's not true. Really, if you actually go and look up now and you see the most viewed video, videos on YouTube, they're cat videos. Even till today, Cat videos are the most watched videos on YouTube. What does that tell you about the ma mentality of the masses? True. What do they want to look at? How many of them are going and educating themselves on business or problem solving or leadership? And so now, you know, with COVID-19 hitting, so many people are finding themselves unprepared and they're like, oh, but you know, everything was going fine. Then COVID happened. COVID's going to happen every four years. There's going to be some sort of a crisis. It always been that way. True. So what were you doing when the things were normal? What were you doing? Were you just going to work and coming back and working a nine to five job or were you thinking further? And so I know that some people are not going to like me saying this time, and I get this, but that's simply because most people don't want to acknowledge the facts and want to be driven by their feelings. True. But here I'm not saying this because I'm trying to be derogatory towards people. I'm saying this because I want to encourage people to go beyond feelings, objectively assess the facts so they can make better decisions for their life and career and not get stuck in the non-professional and the professional zone where there is the highest amount of risk and so if you really care about your financial future and your family's future, you better start thinking. Hmm. Interesting. So I think all boils down to your personal magnification, right? Or like the way you put it, your core philosophy of magnify you, whether it's your mindset, it's your personal skills, um, talents, competence, or even your wealth. So can you help us understand what is your core philosophy of magnify you and why it is more relevant today than ever before? Look, I'm a, you know, there's a thing called a minimalist, right? I'm not a minimalist. I'm a maximalist, mm. if there's such a word. I'm the kind of guy who believes that it's the responsibility of a human being by virtue of the fact that we are the most intelligent and creative species on the planet. We have an obligation to do more than every other species. Simple as that. Right. So, and the good thing is when you do more, you become more. And when you become more, you have more. Right. So the, for me, magnification is about being the best that you can be and making every effort that you can to maximize your potential. Mm -hmm. uh, people might say, why should we maximize our potential? Well, think about it. Would you, if you were running a company, would you hire somebody who was only using 5% of their potential? Of course. Would you throw out a battery that had 95% of reserves left in it? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't. Sure. So why would you accept 5% performance from yourself? Mm. 
right? So for me, Magnify is about having, making the clear and committed decision to magnify your impact, magnify your potential, magnify your performance, which then results in magnified influence and magnified wealth. Right. Right? You take care of the, the main things first, and then the rest will take care of themselves. People's mentality is they want the magnified wealth and they want the magnified influence, but they don't want the magnified performance. They don't want the magnified right. responsibility. Right? And mm -hmm. so that's why a lot of people are struggling today because that mindset is wrong from the beginning. Correct. And, 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 you know, it's a bit like sitting in front of a fireplace and expecting the heat before you put the logs in. Right. So you've got to put the logs in and then you'll get the heat. So worry about the logs. Don't worry about the heat at this point. But that's the mindset shift we've got to change. Mm. And unfortunately, the mindset of entitlement is so deeply embedded, True. especially in the middle class, because the middle class have been quite comfortable. They haven't really experienced poverty. Correct. And so what it's done is, you know, it's a bit like, uh, if I may use this example, if you take a lion from the jungle and you take it out of the jungle and you put it into a circus and you feed it once in the morning and you feed it once in the evening and you do that for three years or five years and then you release that lion back into the jungle, what's going to happen to that lion? It's going to die. It's going to get killed because it has no ability to fend for itself because it's lost all its instincts now. Mm. Right. So when life gets too comfortable, where you've got a warm bed, you have a roof over your head and you have this daily monthly salary coming in. And that allows you to do at least sustain and survive without pushing yourself too hard. The incentive to grow is automatically diminished. Why would you kill when you're getting fed once in the morning and once in the evening? Why would you go for a kill? True. So that diminishes people's capabilities. And what is the long term impact of that? diminished self-esteem, diminished confidence, mm -hmm. right? Because the human spirit was never born to be doing the same thing every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. And so what's, what that's resulting in is, you know, people being living in fear. And what happens when they have living fear, even when they have the skill set, they're not going to be visible. They're not going to talk to anyone. They're not going to express themselves because they're in suppression, not in expression. True. So we have to understand, I'm not saying this, I'm saying this because I care about people, because I want people to do well. I want them to have the life and lifestyle that they've actually dreamt of, rather than settling for the one that they have settled for because of fear. True. And that's why I'm giving you an insight as to how this has even happened today, where despite the fact that we have more technological advancements than we've ever had in the world, we have more opportunities to travel, we have better technology available, medical advance, better medical advances, more longevity in life available, more and more people are anxious, depressed, suicidal, violent, you know, um, opting for more alcohol, uh, addicted to uh, sex entertainment. Why is this happening? Well, it's happening because we are not, I don't think we're living natural lives anymore. I think we've kind of moved away from our spiritual nature and we've kind of, we're trying to control and we're trying to occupy rather than grow. And so that has a cost and people just haven't, you know, the problem is you don't experience the cost of that in the short term, but in the long term, you start to experience it. True. And so that's why when you decide to be a thought leader, in a way, you're actually expressing yourself. It's a, it's a manifestation of your deeper, deepest expression to say, hey, I believe in this. I've had this problem. I solved this problem. Let me help others solve this problem. And I'm going to keep talking about it. And I'm going to keep shifting minds and hearts until I'm able to solve that problem. And so that is what people value and respect. And this is exactly how you look at Gandhi, you know, when he started the movement, he had a country of 200 million people back then, and he only had three or four people that were supporting him. Mm. Well, how did he get hundreds of millions of people to support him? How did he influence mass consciousness through his consciousness? It's because of that conviction and the courage that he had. I agree. In fact, we are at such exciting times in terms of the planetary spiritual transcendence as well, there could just not be a better time for people to adopt the philosophy of thought leadership to solve any idea, any problem that has um, appeared on their horizon and just help more and more people to do something better than what they have had the fortune or the unfortunate to experience in their lives. And that is the reason I want you to share with us 
probably as your closing comments, what are the three things you advise um, to aspiring thought leaders or to I would say inspire more leaders to grow into thought leaders do differently than they've been doing till date, personally, professionally, on the digital and social universe to express their core idea self in a raw, authentic and truly human way? I think the first one would have to be that take take a stock of your skill set, both personal and professional. Hmm. And most people undermine what they've done, right? So you've got to, you know, look back and see how many problems you've solved and think about what are the problems that you're most passionate about. Right. The area that you're most passionate about, you have the highest probability of becoming as genius at that if you put in the time to nurture that talent and, and develop that talent. True. So take a stock of your personal and professional skills and go, what are the things I've done my entire life that I've enjoyed the most and I've solved problems with? Second, become very clear on your philosophy. You've got to have a philosophy. Right. So you see, you've got to believe in something at the end of the day. It can't just be about a job title. It can't just be about a degree and a career and making money. Yes, all of those things are important. I have a degree. I am money-minded. I'm commercially astute. But underlying all of that at the deepest level, there is some meaning to it. I have a philosophy that I very convictedly believe in. And that gives me the energy. It gives me the motivation to do what I do. Third is build your personal brand, which is what we talked about. Mm -hmm. Become very clear on who you are and who you're not. You know, become very clear on your essence of who you are. For example, I say to people, you know, if you were a car, what car would you be? If you were an animal, what animal would you be? If you were a book, what book would you be? If you were a leader, what leader would you be? If you were a song, what song would you be? All right. Because you're trying to understand the essence of who you are. Then try and understand, you know, what makes you unique? What are two or three qualities that everybody sees in you that make you unique? Third, understand your communication style and your personal branding. Like my communication style, as you can see, is very direct. True. I do not change that for anybody. Now, some people love it. Some people hate it. But even if I was to change my communication style, some people are going to love it and some people are going to hate it. It won't make any difference. So I'd rather be genuinely who I am. Mm -hmm. Then your personal style statement. So what's a style statement? As superficial as it sounds, how you look says something about you. you. Is your personal style traditional? Is it sophisticated? Is it classic? Is it grungy? Is it sporty? Is it athletic? You know, is it, um, you've got to know what, what your personal style is. I know who I am. So I dress accordingly. And people might say those things don't matter. They do because it's been researched that the, a person will make an impression about you within the first three to seven seconds. Mm. And the impression that they make about you is on your attractiveness, your credibility, your status, as well as your ability to lead within three to seven seconds. Unfortunately, three to seven seconds is not enough time for you to be able to communicate your message and what you're about. So how you present says a lot about you as well. So these are some of the elements of your personal brand that you want to be clear on. Uh, and your voice is not just your spoken voice, it's also your written voice. My, if you actually look at my stuff on social media, there is a direct tone to it. And it's unapologetic. And it's uncompromising. Some people will go, wow, I love it. Some people go, geez, that's harsh. I don't mean to be harsh, but I don't like to dilute my words either. I know that about myself. So you have to pick what your communication style is. I'm not saying mine is right. I'm saying I, I own mine. And you need to own yours, whatever that is. If you are very polite, then be very polite. All I'm saying is don't pretend to be somebody that you're not. If you want to build your thought leadership, you have to be consistent right throughout. And you can't be consistent if you're not genuine. I agree. I think those are the three things I've personally admired deeply about you is your unique perspective, your paradigm shifting perspective, I should say on the concept of thought leadership, your legendary personal style, and your unapologetic mastery over your speech craft and stage craft. Which brings me to my final question for DR. You have a fantastic new book coming up on the topic of public speaking and expressing yourself as some of the most powerful orators in the history of mankind have done. Can you tell us a little more about that and when can we expect to get a hands on it? Well, thank you so much for asking that question. I, my new book is called 
Um, the Secrets of oh, How to Speak Like the World's Top Public Speakers, I actually forgot the title of the book. Okay. I wrote this book because what I saw was out there, all the public speaking books, they kind of tell you how to stand, how to pitch your voice mm-hmm. and this and that, but they don't really tell you deeply because I have no, I have very little training in public speaking. I only did a very short period of training in public speaking, but really it wasn't the tactical training because the problem with training on public speaking, if you do too much tactical training, you go back into your head and you can't, you fail to have the heart to heart connection and you're not speaking from your soul. Right. So this particular book is actually about sharing the examples of some of the best speakers that we've had in different throughout the ages mm-hmm. and how, without being tactical, in their own style, and everyone had their own style. None of them did the same thing. They were all able to have deep impact by not denying who they were, but by owning it. So it's a very different perspective on public speaking. And it's a deeper perspective rather than the tactical perspective. If you want a tactical perspective, you can just Google how to speak well. You right. get all this stuff, you know, stand like this, talk like this, use voice variation, use pauses. Yes, all of that's a part of public speaking as well. But fundamentally, at the deepest level, you've got to understand that nothing is more powerful than somebody who owns who they are, Mm. because that's what connects with people, not with everybody. And you're not here to connect with everybody. You are here to connect with the people that you want to serve. As an example, I only want to serve ambitious people. Right. When people say to me, you know, um, you know, uh, you're a motivational speaker. I say, I'm not. I'm not here to motivate anybody. I'm just here to transform motivated people. So they must be ambitious already when they come to me. So that I know that. So my direct style works very well with ambitious people because they're thick skinned. It doesn't work with people who lack motivation in many cases because they're overly sensitive and they're driven by feelings. Right. So this philosophy and this sense of knowing allows me to be a more convicted speaker. And when I'm a more convicted speaker, my words naturally come out rather than me having to think through it and rehearse them. It comes out naturally because there's alignment, inner alignment. And that's what I've tried to illustrate in my book through examples of many people. And a lot of them have glossophobia. They had a lot of, they have the fear of public speaking and they never got over it. They never got over it. They never applied any tactics. They spoke despite the fear, but because they spoke from the soul and they spoke from the, from the heart, they were still able to make an impact. Wow. Amazing. I personally believe that, uh, okay integral part of your personal brand is your speaker brand and uh, I personally can't wait to get my hands on this book and I'm really very grateful to you that you agreed to give us a sneak peek into this upcoming book of yours so for everyone's uh, benefit I'm going to share this that Ron's going to be sharing a couple of chapters from his book with us for all you people who are going to be a part of our festival and uh, kickstart your journey of reinventing your personal brand and your speaker brand as well. So thank you so much, Ron, for that generosity for our audience. No problem. Thank you so much. And uh, you asked such great questions. I enjoyed this discussion. Uh, So thank you very much for bringing me on your stage and giving me the opportunity today. Oh, the pleasure was all mine. Certainly, it's been a truly enriching hour of discussion. I know we overstepped time, but thank you so much for accommodating this extension of time and sharing such awe-inspiring insights and experiences with us. I'm very, very grateful for your time and contribution to the festival. Thank you and um, look forward to speaking to you very soon. Thank you, Tanvi. Take care of yourself, Ron. Bye.